Hello, everyone, and uh, happy that uh, you're able to join us here today, whether you're uh, in the room or watching this recording. And uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, Method Space is a vibrant online community, and we're interested in all things to do with designing, planning, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, sharing results in ways that we hope will make a difference. And as you can see at the heart of this diagram, we have teaching and learning because we think that whether you are brand new to research, a student or a very experienced researcher, we all have something to learn. And I know that I'll be learning a lot uh, today uh, from this webinar. Uh, next slide. And just as a brief introduction, I am the manager for Method Space. So um, if you're interested in following up, contributing or uh, being part of this community, I hope you will get in touch. And uh, this topic is of interest to me uh, as author of the new edition for doing qualitative research online and someone with just a, a great uh, belief in the value of research and curiosity about methods. Uh, next slide. Which is why I'm delighted to have this uh, panel here today uh, to uh, participate in a lively discussion. So we have um, Dr. Dr. Rebecca Bayek, who is Assistant Professor in Instructional Technology and Learning Sciences at the Utah State University. Spencer Greenlay, who is Assistant Professor of Information and Communication Technology at the University of Kentucky's School of Information Science. Arceli Rosario, Professor and Chair of the Education Department of the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in the Philippines. Um, she is also the incoming president of the Asian Qualitative uh, Research Association and the co-editor of the forthcoming SAGE Handbook of Qualitative Research in an Asian Context. And you'll be hearing more about that on Method Space in, in months to come. And Tutelani Asino, who is Associate Professor in Educational Technology and Director of the Emerging Technology and Creativity Research Lab in the School of Educational Foundations, Leadership and Aviation at the Oklahoma State University's College of Education and Health Sciences. So welcome everyone. So just to kick off our discussion, move to the next slide. We're talking about the topic of culture and research. And this uh, follows a, a webinar and series of posts we had last fall about uh, international research and equitable research. And out of that, you know, Rebecca came to me and said, well, we, you know, let's, let's talk more about culture. So what do we mean by culture? And I pulled a couple of uh, definitions here that I thought were kind of interesting that show how culture, you know, writ, you know, as widely as we want to, to discuss, whether it's within an organization, a community, or across the world, that, you know, we understand it, we, we experience it, and express it as individuals, but the, the important piece is that it's something that we share with others, that, you know, we share with another group of people who, who understand, you know, some aspect of life, you know, in the same way that we do. Um, next slide. So you, using those definitions to say, well, then as researchers, you know, when we enter another culture, which living where I do in Boulder, Colorado might involve driving a hundred miles, I'm going to be in another culture or, you know, being in another, even a part of my own community, let alone, you know, contacting people across the globe. So we enter another culture, you know, we may find that we don't have what that definition called as the shared mental software needed to understand and interpret the signals we're getting. You know, as, as much as we may want to be respectful, we may just not understand. So what can we do as researchers to create a, an environment where, you know, we can work more successfully, you know, when we kind of leave the, the space that we're comfortable in. Next slide. So to explore that, we're posing this same question to 
all of our panelists. Uh, and then once they have uh, responded, we'll have a little chance for them to have some dialogue across the panel, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So as Chris mentioned, please uh, post your questions throughout. So here's what we want to explore. What do you, as a panelist, who a lot of experience in this uh, area, what do you wish that researchers understood before going into another culture or coming into your own culture um, when they're planning to collect data, especially when studying sensitive issues? So uh, Rebecca, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer, for that and for the introduction as well. Um, Nasi wrote a very interesting paper, I think it was in 2006, where she talked about uh, learning as a cultural process. And I was just kind of bored from her words and just to say that, you know what, research is a cultural process, right? Because when you get into, and I think that's something that uh, we, as researchers, we need to learn, but actually taking course, we make it as kind of you know, uh, the framework with which we get into data collection, uh, interview, what, whatsoever. Why is it important? Because again, when you come into a culture, when you come into a different context, what happens is that you bring with you your way of understanding, your way of doing things. So if you want to be fair, if you want to be uh, equitable in the way you interpret, but also interact with the people you are researching, then you want to understand that, hey, I'm bringing in a set, a, set, a set of framework, a set of understanding, then now because of that, I have to pay attention to what the other people are doing or the, mm -hmm. what the other people are saying, because that may uh, counter have or go against whatever. I have been, uh, you know, I've mm -hmm, been trained mm -hmm. to uh, whatever I've learned. Why is it? Because sometimes what happens is that when I go, if I don't recognize that uh, research is also a cultural process, that when I go into a different cultural context, I may interpret what I see as what I've learned or what I'm coming from. I'll give a quick example that I do remember when I was doing my um, dissertation research. And one thing that happened in the cultural context of Cameroon where is almost like when people speak, you don't speak alone. It's kind of, a, I would put it a way that, you know what, when you see your brother, it's almost like a communal way of doing things. But during mm -hmm. the interview process, because everybody knows that if, if you ask a question, if I know the answer, I can just jump in. So people are just jumping in and we're like, how, how, do, we, how do we make sense of it? So when I came back, uh, <laughs> my team was like, this focus group, I'm like, no, this is not a focus group because when you go back again, so if you do not understand that culture is uh, uh, not that research is a cultural process, then there is danger that you will not represent or even interpret the data that uh, you uh, collect or even interact in a very, very fair way, right, uh, with the, the people or the, the issue that you're researching. So I will stop there to pass mm. it over to Spencer uh, for further comments. All right, hi everyone. I'm Spencer Greenhall. I am uh, a social media researcher. I specialize in how social media is used in teaching and learning settings. Uh, but if we can bring up my slides, uh, I have also been expanding into other meaningful uses of social media, uh, including how they're used in religious and political ways. And I would like to share this meme that comes from some of the research data that I'm working on right now uh, to make one point that I think is uh, really important for this conversation, and that is culture is everywhere, including places that we would not expect to find it. So again, this is a meme. It's a low quality image that's being shared on social media. We might not think of it as being all that culturally relevant. There are typos in it. The font choices are questionable. The art isn't all that great. We're, not, we're you know, even if we're thinking about culture, this might not be what we have in mind. Uh, but I'd like to discuss at least three different layers of culture that are present in this. If we could go to the next slide, I have been ragging on this picture a little bit uh, for being low quality and typos and things like that. But it turns out that's perhaps an intentional choice uh, in online spaces which have their own cultures. Uh, there is a celebration of the sloppy and the amateurish in some of these spaces. And so uh, understanding that this may not be a high work of art that, that's intentional, that reflects community values, there is an internet culture that, that this is deliberately drawing from. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, there, there's even more going on here. So this is uh, a project looking at a religious community on Twitter that is also borrowing 
from um, some political movements. And if you look at these crudely drawn uh, meme figures and you compare it to classic works of Mormon art, you can see deliberate references to uh, these works of art, these shared understandings of what particular Mormon historical figures looked like in the meme. So again, low quality art, kind of crudely drawn, but very, very intentional uh, cultural references going on in there. And if we go to the next slide, we can see, in fact, one more layer to this. I mentioned earlier, this isn't just a religious community. It's one that's borrowing for, uh, political rhetoric from other communities, including extremist rhetoric from uh, political communities. So two of the figures in uh, this meme not only draw from references to Mormon culture, Mormon art, uh, but they actually also draw from the Groiper figure, which is uh, used in far right circles as sort of uh, a symbol of white nationalists and other values. And these are not values, right? These are cultural values. They are not values that I would celebrate necessarily, but we can't understand this image without understanding all of these layers of culture. First, that the sloppiness of it, the amateur nature of the art is an intentional reference to internet culture. Second, that there are deliberate references to Mormon, a particular religious culture in here. And then third, that there are also references to a political culture. Um, again, in this third case, at least, it's not something that we necessarily want to celebrate, but we can't understand what's going on here unless we are willing to accept that even a hastily drawn image that's just tweeted out into the void is culturally relevant. We can't research that properly unless we understand the cultural elements. So thank you very much. I'll pass it over to Arceli now. Okay, I'm uh, coming from the Philippines. I want to speak about Asia. So as researchers, what do I want you to understand when you come to my culture, and that is the Asian culture. Asia is very diverse, I understand, and I think you understand that too, but there are uh, similarities across the different uh, countries. And I will speak about three of these, that Asia is a collectivist society, a high power distance society, and that the people have weak uncertainty avoidance. So I, next slide, please. And so what does this imply uh, being a collective society? What do you want? What are the implications when you come to the Asian region? So the first here is that uh, Asians are more open to questions about personal life, that it is okay for you to ask for age, for marital status, number of children, etc. And in fact, that is welcome. It means that it's like a, a way of building your rapport with your participants and that when you research about sensitive topics, you will be surprised that your participants will be willing to talk about them. And then researchers should build relationships with the community and that it is okay. I put quotes here that you as researchers, you can invade into your participants' personal time and personal space. They are willing to sacrifice time and even welcome you to their homes. And being communal, this is the challenge because you may find it difficult to talk with your participants as some members of the community, the household maybe, will also listen to the interview. Next slide. And being a high power uh, distance society, what does it mean? It means that uh, to uh, high power, uh, I think the other slide, uh, Laura, uh, okay, let me talk about this uh, weak uncertainty avoidance. This means, uh, next slide, Laura, please. So this weak uncertainty avoidance, this means that uh, to Asians, time is flexible. You do not expect your participants to come at the agreed time. We call this rubber time. Uh, we can uh, start late and end late, and Asians prefer less structure and less formal interviews, and Asians are more open to meet strangers. They may be shy at first, and that credentials of the researcher is not as important, so you do not come and say, I'm doctor, so and so. Asians easily accept us outsiders into the community. Okay, next slide, Laura. Yeah, so uh, what does it mean? What is the implication or what are the implications being a uh, high power decent society that we treat older, as researcher, you treat the older participants with utmost respect. 
and that it's difficult if you put young and old in a focus group because the younger participants will not speak. And your participants, when you talk to them, they may not look at you in the eye, but it does not mean that they are not interested. And silence, uh, they may be silent and may not speak as much as you, uh, uh, as you like, but that is just uh, the Asian way of showing respect. Now, uh, next slide, talking about online data collection in Asia, we face some challenges. Next slide. And one of these challenges is that uh, internet connections here are not distributed evenly. They're uh, in or urban areas, yes. In rural areas, connection may be a challenge. So if you are doing online data collection, you should check if your participants firstly even have the needed device. And I remember that when uh, Wang and Boris did their photo voice study in Asia, they provided their participants with cameras. And I think you may need to provide also your participants with the needed device. Also check if your participants have access to internet connection and the best way uh, Asians work with somebody who is present. So maybe you can uh, connect with a research assistant who is here physically present on the site and spend time. The first contact may be just for getting to know each other and also with older participants and in rural, rural areas for data gathering through online platforms where you expect your participants to uh, respond to each other, you know, chat form and or whatever platform, you may not get rich data. So this is all and uh, I will pass to Dr. Lini. Hello, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Tutalini Asino, and I am at um, currently at Oklahoma State. And um, I'm happy to be going last because I could just steal all the answers that were given uh, earlier. Um, but I want to pick up sort of um, where um, I'm going to be integrating my responses sort of with, with what was already said earlier. Uh, so I'm going to start off at um, where, where Rebecca sort of uh, got us going where she said that culture uh, research is a cultural process. And I think that's really important to know because um, the other way that, the other thing that I would add to that is also that researchers are learners, right? Um, we are students, we are trying to understand something. So we really need to treat our research context as live classrooms uh, and our participants and our environment as our teachers. Right, so there's a, there's a sort of symbiotic relationship that is really important to know. You cannot do cross-cultural research without um, th uh, the following, I believe, uh, three or four things, right? One is respect, one is understanding, um, the other one is valuing of, of, of partnership. What I mean by respect here is that um, you need to start respecting the cultures. Um, you start off by understanding their histories, before you even go there. Um, and I'm coming at this from an African perspective as an African researcher who is a Namibian by birth. Um, and for me, that understanding is incredibly important because it doesn't mean that you only understand when colonialism started and when colonialism ended. You have to understand the pre and the post of that process. So you really need to understand that culture. It's it's really easy to respect that which you understand and you already have assigned value. It's much harder when you think that the people that you are studying are less than you. And there is no other context, in my opinion, that we disrespect more than an African context that we already think that people are behind. So while it sort of is, it's, it's fairly understood that you have to understand your participant, it's a little bit uh, harder to acknowledge that when the people you are studying, you don't think they're on your level, right? Um, but it's also that you have to respect your, your participants, right? You have to engage um, with the participants because the reason why you're engaging with them is because they know something and because you want them to provide answers to you. And there's a level of respect that, that is very, very important, right? Uh, the second one, which is about understanding. Um, in my culture, Awambo, people of the northern part of Namibia, I can guarantee you that if you come in on your first visit to collect data, you won't get accurate data. 
right? You just will not because we have a cultural practice of treating visitors differently. So what we're gonna give you is a curated uh, a data set that treats you because you're the visitor, we value you, we, we do all of these type of things. The second time, you'll probably be able to knock that down. The third time is probably when you really start to break some of that stuff down. So you need to understand that part of the culture. In addition to what Janet had said at the beginning, I really like also the definition that UNESCO gives, because I think it, it captures this notion of culture much, much more broadly, which is this idea that UNESCO defines culture as the set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of the society or social group that encompasses not only art, literature, but lifestyles, ways of living together, value system, traditions, and beliefs. It's an incredibly broad uh, definition that encaptures, I think, so many things. And that brings me back to what Spencer was saying. Culture is everywhere, right? It includes place, it, it, it's present in places that we might not even think of. And memes are one of those spaces, right? Like, well, how is culture present in there? But it is very much um, present in there. You have to value the partnership. Research is a partnership. Uh, for me, um, whenever I do research in another community, I always identify a partner that I can engage with before I go there. So they can sort of help me translate the culture in the way that they understand it. Because I think that is incredibly important. And I think the reason why that is important is sort of goes back to what uh, Arceli was saying in her, in her reflection. And she reminded us that when you're collecting data, there are some questions that are okay to ask in some context, some that are not okay to ask, right? She said that in Asian cultures, you can ask about marital status and, and everything else like that. In the context of Namibia, for example, and a lot of different African countries where uh, ethnicity and um, sort of cultural traditions because of colonialism are, are contested, Asking for ethnicities and cultural origin is not necessarily okay in the context of Namibia, because then someone can say, well, why are you asking whether I'm Owambo, Herero, and so forth? Are you trying to say something about my, my being? Because those characteristics have been used to divide us during colonialism, apartheid, and everything else like that. So that part of the data collection is, is really, really important. So so that I don't take off all the time, I'll pause here and just pass it back to, to Janet. Well, you've all given us a, a lot to think about in terms of process, as well as say, you know, the, quest, the questions themselves that we might be posing in an interview, a focus group or in an instrument like a, a survey instrument. So um, I, I want to just, open it up for you to, to comment to one another. What, what did you hear that you would like to build on or, or reinforce or, or contrast from your own perspective? Uh, Janet, may I ask Spencer? Yes. Yes, Spencer, thank you so much for showing those um, memes, you know. Uh, it did not make, make sense to me when I first saw the uh, when I saw the first slide. But then you were saying that okay, these are the the art that is out there in social media. Uh, for you, you were able to see okay the different layers. But for me, as a novice researcher, how do I see that? How do I train myself so that? I see these different layers that are out there. That's a, a fantastic question. Uh, it's important that I recognize first that I come with some insider perspective to this particular culture, not in all ways and certainly not in the white nationalist ways, uh, but I, I, um, I, I have some understanding of some of the cultures that this community is drawing from. And, and that gives me a leg up. Uh, I'm also working with a co-author on this project who is who comes from an outsider perspective. Um, and her perspective is actually just as valuable because she can pick up on things that I take for granted uh, through insider eyes, but uh, that are that, that stand out a little bit more if you're not familiar with them. Uh, so 
I don't know that I'm cheating so much, but uh, I, I have some background uh, that gives me some shared culture. Uh, and again, in, in some of the ways, not all of the ways. Uh, but speaking of not sharing culture in all of the ways, um, you know, when it comes to the internet culture, when it comes to the, the political perspectives that are shared uh, within this community, oftentimes I'm running into things that, that are not familiar to me. And uh, as a result, um, I don't know quite the way, right way to put it, but I've had to develop sort of a sixth sense to, to try and think where does a phrase, where does an image feel like it is conveying more meaning than I can recognize. Uh, and to, to try and from a meta sense, even if I don't understand a particular reference, try to develop a sense for when there might be a reference present. And when something is, is just scratching at the back of my brain saying, Spencer, that there's something important here that you don't quite understand, then I pause and I take time, and sometimes it's quite a bit of time, uh, to, to look for similar ways that phrase has been used, to turn um, to other researchers or even to uh, crowdsourced uh, places, uh, places like the Urban Dictionary or Know Your Meme when I'm talking specifically about internet culture. These are not scholarly sources, but they have documented uh, phrases and, and elements of internet culture that I may not be as familiar with. Uh, so. Uh, I could keep talking a lot for this, but uh, I think developing that sixth sense of, of trying to recognize where, and I'm not perfect at this, I don't think anyone is, but uh, trying to get a sense for when something is more meaningful uh, than it appears to be, uh, even if I don't understand it, recognizing that I don't understand it, but I feel like I should understand it, uh, that is an invitation for me to stop, to not move on to other data, but to sit with this data and sit with other sources until I can start to piece together a sense of what I was missing in the first place. Thank you. Rebecca, you look one, like you've yeah, got a I question. One, yeah, sure. I, I think one of the very interesting things that you both uh, brought uh, up was, you know, the inside and the outside of perspective, right? And also imagine you're a young researcher, uh, uh, so Tiny was talking about, you know, what his his own the Namibian cultural context. Where if you go for the first time, you would not, you know, you get the curated data, and then you know, second time. So sometimes kind of scary for somebody who's not native, an insider from the culture, right? So how uh, I feel like so far we've been discussing, but how do we? And I go back to your question, I say like, how do we train ourselves? How how will a young researcher feel comfortable enough, right, to get into a context? Or cultural context that they or yeah, he or she does not understand very well. What kind of tools uh, um, does the person need, right, to kind of get feel comfortable and at least interpret the data in a way that uh, would make sense, would be equitable, right? So be, be be a fair representation of the people or the issue that the person is studying. I think I wanted to kind of just throw it out there and then bring in the the inside and the outside uh, perspective. Uh, may I speak to that? Um, if you are coming to Asia, and I think totally any mention about understanding the people first. And so, uh, okay, let me talk about East and West. And or, okay, we are Asians and usually researchers who come here, especially in some decades or centuries ago, the first researchers who came here were actually like uh, Europeans, Americans. And so they came here with the Western lens, but it's like uh, measuring us as Asians with their lens when in fact, that's not the way they should look at us because we do things, we understand things differently. I would, Try, I like to suggest that you should begin with philosophical uh, uh, frameworks, uh, understanding how the thinking of the people you are researching operates. And these days, our challenge actually, and we have had a, a discussion about this, is that we need to, to put forth, publish, uh, 
our philosophical orientation and we ourselves understand our philosophical orientations. This is our need. That's why in the Asian Qualitative Research Association, we are starting that conversation, just knowing who we are and putting on, on print so that other researchers from other culture will be able to understand us in a deeper way. Because I think when we do research, we should not be, um, we should not, look at things uh, at the surface level. We should go very, very deep. Yeah, um, I, I can just. Yes, yes, I was just gonna uh, to, to ask you to, to jump in because I think, you know, when you were talking about the partnership uh, aspect that, you know, that kind of gives you hopefully, ideally a bridge between the the insider and the, and coming in as, as an outsider. And so, you know, please go on, but I, I hope you'll also talk a little bit about steps that people can take. You know, how do you find uh, someone who would be respected within the community, yeah. you know, who could help you, you know, as a partner in that way? Yeah, um, no, thank you. Um, and, and I want to, I, I don't think there's any, there's no perspective between inside and outside a perspective, both perspectives are valuable. I think often we tend to sort of create a hierarchy of which one is more valuable than not. And we know this from so many cultural metaphors that exist, right? In, in, in the English sense, one of them is, um, you know, you can't see uh, the tree from the forest or something to that extent, right? That there's this, this idea that when you're in the middle of forest, you're able to see these granular details about the trees that are out there. But when you are above, you can see a much more broader perspective. And for me, that I have that appreciation because of uh, sort of um, earlier experiences in anthropology where that sort of that emic etic perspective uh, and so forth, that there's, there's no, for me, there, there is no one that is higher than, than, than the other. I think they are both equally uh, important for, for different reasons. Um, but I think I wanna back up a little bit and sort of go back to what I was saying earlier about understanding. You as a novice researcher or an experienced researcher, you have to, there's a concept of understanding that for me is really important. And that's not just about understanding the context or understanding the people, it's understanding yourself, right? In this sort of in qualitative research, we talk about positionality, right? That is incredibly important. If you, are doing qualitative research and you don't understand yourself, that for me is the equivalent of doing quantitative research with an invalidated instrument, right? Because as a qualitative researcher, you are the instrument. So if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what makes you tick, if you don't know the biases you hold and all of those things, the data you're going to collect is going to be flawed because you don't understand yourself. So for me, that is incredibly important that you first take that step, that very reflective practice and say, okay, you know, who am I? I'm, I might be very nervous about traveling abroad, right? I might be the kind of person who is incredibly afraid of seeing certain type of people, right? Um, I Let me just personalize it. I have had as a black person, Many people cross the street when I when they see me coming because of that fear of somebody being black. Now, if you're crossing the street when you see me coming without even knowing me, but you're the same person who's gonna go and do research in a country full of black people, that's an issue. If you are a man who is already sexist, and you're going to be studying a, a phenomenon based on gender, and you haven't reflected on your sexism, that's an issue because you're gonna have data that's colored. So I think that's really, uh, for me, that, that importance of really reflective on who you are um, and, 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 and because that's gonna color the data that you collect. And if I can jump in, sorry, Rebecca, I don't mean to, to cut you off. Uh, to Delaney's comments about the, the value of both the insider and the outsider really stuck out to me. That's something that I've experienced myself. But it also reminded me of an article I recently read by Ellen Decoe in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods, where she complicates 
uh, this idea of insider outsider and, and taking examples from her own research. Uh, she discusses how it's not just a binary, right? It's not just you're either completely insider or completely outsider, but she complicates that by talking about research that she did in a community that she grew up in. She now lives halfway across the world. Uh, she's, you know, um, been separated from that community in a few different ways. And because of that, she has some insider perspectives, but also some outsider perspectives at the same time. Um, and I won't try and summarize the whole article, but just to say that uh, it, this insider outsider, it, it's possible to oversimplify that, that there are ways that, uh, you know, we ought to be complicating this and ask how uh, this exists along a spectrum and maybe even a multi-dimensional spectrum. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you went before because actually that's the point I wanted to bring. And I actually also wrote a, uh, recently an article in the International Journal of Qualitative Method where I talk about looking at my personal research, my own research, where it's not really binary, where uh, when I was researching the board game called Songo in Cameroon, what was happening was that uh, though I knew the community and I grew up in the community, so I understand, you know, uh, the Wondo people and all of that. But what was happening was that because uh, it was in the board game space, that song board game space, I was at the same time an insider, so almost simultaneously, because when they were playing the game, then I was an outsider. But when they were talking, because I understand the language and the, some of the practices, I was an insider. So it's really not a, a binary thing. We are actually both right at the same time, and then it happens. And I think that's one thing that uh, um, researchers definitely need to understand is that you are uh, often not completely an outsider. You are both. And it just happens at different moments. So there are moments where you're an insider, there are moments that you're outsider. And sometimes you don't even realize because things happen at such a personal level. And I think what, that's why the, the point that I, I said in uh, Tiny brought up is really important because you definitely need to understand the people you're studying, but also you need to understand uh, uh, yourself and know who you are so that when this uh, dynamism, I think it's something very emotional Quantation is, is extremely emotional, it's extremely personal. So you definitely need to understand yourself, understand the people you're talking so that you know what's going on, so that you can actually, um, what's that, filter, right? And definitely get where, because you are the instrument at the end of the day. And something that I actually liked about uh, what uh, Asali said uh, was, uh, you know, the Asian uh, qualitative research society definitely try to put out there ways, um, their own perspective, like trying to frame themselves because and I think the same thing happened in the African continent where we've had the anthropologists that came, where you know that kind of uh, uh, white supremacist view where they look down the people. And if you go, some of the research that anthropologists wrote, it's just amazing what they wrote. And I think uh, what uh, healing ourselves from that, uh, be that you're, uh, a researcher from the continent, uh, from Africa, or if you're so called, healing yourself from that, like, uh, what's that? Yeah, healing yourself from that is extremely important. And I think as research, be that you're a novice or an experience, you definitely need to sit back and uh, do that kind of inner work before you involve yourself in any kind of uh, data collection. And then I think that will be true for quantitative researchers as well, because no matter what we say, it's something that uh, has to do, we become, uh, in a way, we are instruments of uh, the research that we are conducting. I wonder if I, uh, if I can just follow up on Rebecca on what you're saying there. Um, one is that we, we're sort of talking about this in, in, in the way that um, the researcher is going to a space that they're not familiar with, right? Um, and I think I was trained to identify that, which was easier. What I was not trained and I learned when I was in the field is when you're studying your own culture, right? Um, because there's certain assumption that you make. You're like, well, I, I know this place. I know my people. My, my dissertation study years ago was studying uh, comparative study on Botswana and Namibia. I was like, well, I'm Namibian. I, I understand my culture. Uh, but when I was just next door, so I really understand that. So I thought I, I knew um, I had an inside of you. But for me, the analogy that I can give is almost the difference between eating a cake versus baking it, right? Um, you can't eat a great cake and you're like, well, because I've eaten it, I, I definitely know how to make this, right? We know how to consume research. We don't know how to make it. 
especially when it's your own culture. And I had to really con sort of walk through and think through what does it mean to be an insider when you're researching the inside? Because you're not an insider anymore in the sense, in, um, in the true sense, you're kind of seeing yourself from above. And that requires you to suspend certain things as well. Um, so I think you, 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 uh, you know, um, and, and I think it, it's, it's what both Spencer and Rebecca were saying here that you, you are sort of both, right? Um, you're, you're both an insider and an outsider in just about every context in some sort of way. But I also want to, um, to, to, to go back to, I, I see some questions uh, in, in the chat about, you know, how does this translate to quantitative research and so forth? I don't think what we're saying here is about quantitative or qualitative. I think it's easier to apply it in a qualitative lens. But I think one of the falsity that we promote when we're teaching quality, when we're teaching research methods is somehow that in quantitative research, you don't have to deal with these things because it's just objective. But at the end of the day, it's a human being who designs that quantitative instrument. You decide the measures that you're going to be using. You decide the, and you design the experiment that is going to be run. So I don't think that there is anything on this planet that is human made that is objective, right? Anything that is created by a human being is embedded with it, some sort of personal biases, personal values and everything else. So I think that's, I don't want to give the, 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 the notion that this is only about qualitative or quantitative. Um, even when you're doing quantitative research, you still have to respect culture. You still have to understand the people. You still have to value those partnership. Uh, you still have to really understand that, um, you know, culture is everywhere. So I think this is really sort of across the board of all research methods. Okay, so uh, here's something that I want to share with you. And we're talking about the insider outsider experience. Sometimes uh, the realization that you are an outsider comes to you only. But I had an experience when uh, for my thesis, I went to my mother's home place and it was far, I, I, that was my first time to come. My mother was with me. And so it's like they embrace us. It's like a long lost daughter, you know, coming home. And so there was rejoicing. And so I felt I was an insider. But as the days went by, I was studying on retrieving the oral literature of my mother's people. Uh, people. So they were telling me uh, uh, folk tales and songs and poems, etc. But there was this event that they invited me to uh, go with them. And they were praying. And I could not participate in the songs and in the prayers. They were saying like, come join. Here's the song book. Here's the prayer book. But I could not like uh, be part of them. And they sensed that. And Rebecca, you mentioned that realize that you're an outsider can be uh, an emotional moment, but that was really compound, uh, like a, a compounded experience because I hurt, because I felt I there was a divide and I sensed that they hurt too because they realized that I did not completely belong. So how did I deal with that? I, for several days, I thought about that. I reflected about that. And I just, realize that I have to accept who I am. And uh, Totalina, you mentioned about reflexivity, knowing who you are, accepting who you are, accepting the limitations of who you are. And eventually I'm happy that I left that place and I felt that I was able to embrace them and they too are able to embrace me. So we're going to... Um transition into uh, responding to questions from our attendees. I want to just, you know, reinforce some of the things that I've heard from um, our panelists, the importance of self-awareness and, you know, really throughout the entire process. And, and then, you know, also the responsibility to communicate, you know, what it is that you do understand about your own culture, you know, as well as any culture you're entering. And I think with that 
expanded definition that uh, Tudelani shared with us, you know, we think, well, well, you know, there are all those different aspects that we want to look at. And, you know, to, to begin to understand the culture we're going into. So all of those things, I think, you know, add to, you know, if we're thinking about the research design for qualitative or quantitative, that we need to build in the time to, to do, you know, that kind of advanced preparation. And I want to just, you know, emphasize what Tutelani said about the, you know, with this, you know, if you're a quantitative researcher, you might think, well, you know, I'm not interviewing people, so do I need to know this kind of stuff? Well, you're probably still going to need to get access to the organization where you want to um, conduct a survey or even where you want to access a database or archive or, uh, you know, some other kinds of sources. So, you know, whether you are using what these kinds of uh, the advice we're trying to offer uh, with participants or with with others uh, in the field, you know, to to gain access and and to uh, to build a, you know, to get um, ethical approval, etc. Uh, I think the, these ideas, you know, are broadly apply. So, Chris, what kinds of uh, questions do we have uh, from our participants? Thanks, Janet. Uh, we've had lots of questions through, so thank you, everybody. Um, the first one I'd like to put to the to the panel is uh, Kipley comments on cultural complexity, and asks how can a researcher write a comprehensive conclusion about the society when the researcher only stays in the field for a limited period of time. That's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, I I hardly put the word conclusion in anything that I write. And the reason why I do that is that I don't know if I've ever concluded at research, right? Um, because I think there's always more for me to learn. So comprehensive is, is incredibly difficult, right? Because um, culture is not static. Uh, it continues to, to grow, it continues to change, it continues to evolve. So I think, um, I don't know if you can ever do a fully comprehensive cultural um, study, uh, and, and I, I stand to be corrected by my fellow panelists. Um, I think you write a comprehensive research manuscript based on what you have uh, collected at that at, at, in that snapshot, right? Um, that's why, especially if you look at work that anthropologists do, is that they spend a career studying uh, uh, a set of issue or set of uh, a group of people because they keep going back over and over and learning more and more. So I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to do that. I think your responsibility is not to write a comprehensive manuscript about a whole culture and a society. Your responsibility is to, is to provide a, a detailed accounting of the data that you have collected or the information that has been shared with you every time that you're doing that research, knowing that that might change the next time you go, uh, or you might have to update it. Uh, you know, like this is, uh, I'm, I'm sure Jenna could probably speak to this because of the books that she has written where there's many different editions because you have to keep going back and adding more uh, and more because there's not, there's no, I find it hard to identify a final point um, uh, in my perspective. I don't know if anybody has a different uh, perspective on that. I just yeah. want to say, oh, go ahead, Arcelia. Go ahead, yes, sir. Okay. No, go ahead, please. Uh, I am reminded of comments that Rebecca and Tutelani made earlier in the webinar. Uh, Rebecca started us off with this idea that research itself is a cultural process. It has its own cultural values. Those values are not necessarily self-evident. Um, they are not necessarily the only way to do research. I think there's a, a common perception among the general public, but even among researchers that, you know, the research methods fell from the sky. We discovered like the right way to do it. It's, we could make a periodic table of them. This is how the universe works. But I think Rebecca's perspective is a lot more helpful. This is a cultural process. Uh, many of these values like comprehensibility 
and generalization, these are uh, values that we have adopted rather than uh, universal laws of research. Um, and so Tutelani was talking earlier, you know, ob objectivity is one of these other values that we have placed on research. But that's more of a cultural value uh, than anything else. And this isn't to dismiss um, the work of, of good people who are striving for objectivity or striving for generalizability. I think those have a place in the right time, but I think it's also um, important for us to consider you know, are these things that we are striving for in our research, are we doing those because those are actually necessary? Are we doing them because they are actually important? Or are we doing that because our research culture tells us that they are important? Um, and we may come to either conclusion, but I think it's very important to ask that question. Uh, I would like to speak about, uh, there's a mention there, a phrase within a short period of time in the question. And that's so true. I deal with uh, my uh, advisees who would prefer to do their dissertation in a short period of time. Like they, okay, for example, they say, oh, I'm going to do a case study with this university. Mom, can I go there and do this one in three days? And I say, well, really, you can do that one in three days. Um, yes, I think for me, uh, we because the, our society has changed and uh, we mentioned earlier about uh, anthropologists uh, researchers going to the research sites and staying there for weeks and for months and some even for years but i think our time has changed but uh for me still we should not really be like instant 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 about everything we should recognize that gaining knowledge is a process and this enlightenment the layers <laughs> i like the what uh, spencer said it even looking at the picture you have to look at layers and layers and more so uh, looking into the community the community uh, is composed of layers, so many layers, so many intersectionality that you have to discover. So I say, yes, take time, not, do not shorten the time. Uh, I remember that uh, we have authors saying like Lincoln and Guba saying persistent observation, prolonged engagement. How long is long? You have to deal that with your uh, advisors committee, a dissertation committee, but I would say do not sacrifice time to understand what you are really wanting to understand. All right. Um, so um, Kevin comments that uh, he really liked what Tutelani was saying about knowing yourself as a qualitative researcher. And he asks, do you think that the researcher is also responsible to their audience and the fields they publish within to disclose this? And he asked this because he's looking to expand uh, his repertoire of explanations uh, to his doctoral methodology students that reporting one's positionality is not just okay, but also helps audiences understand the study and the conclusions better. Um, absolutely. I think, I think that's incredibly important. I tend to, in my own work, um, whenever I give a, a talk, I tend to start off with telling people where I come from. Um, telling people about where I went to school, what degrees I have, and all of these type of backgrounds, which is part of my identity. It's not, uh, and I always make a joke, I say, I'm not bragging about what I have. I want you to understand where I come from so you can understand what I'm saying and the lens with which I'm, 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 I'm sort of looking at this phenomenon. So I think, I think positionality statements are really important. Um, those are sort of common in qualitative research, I wish they were more common across research uh, uh, traditions all around. Um, I think it's I think it's incredibly important to have our students practice writing those, and to also know that those um, those uh, um, those change, right? Um, I think it was uh, um, uh, the scholar Franz Fanon who says that through the world in which I travel, I'm endlessly recreating myself. Right, so it, it's it's a it's a constant process that evolves, and I think we need to be able to 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 state that and say this is who I am, this is how I come to the world. Right, one of the things that I had to, for example, do is that um, I I always spell Africa with a K, right, and and I was asked that often as to why that is, and I had to reflect on that and actually write that out and say this is why I do it. I'm not saying everybody should write Africa with a K, but you need to understand why 
I am doing it. If you agree with that and then you adopt that, that's fine. But you need to at least understand why I'm doing it this way, right? Um, so, so I think it's definitely positionality statements uh, and, and knowing yourself and having uh, our students know how to do that is incredibly important. Thank you. I wonder if we've got time for, for one quick uh, last question. Uh, Maria asks, uh, when collecting data virtually or through social media, are there any cultural recommendations such as what type of information is more important or if there's any some or is it, if there is something specific researchers could use to their advantage to recruit more data from that culture i'm going to give a sideways answer to this um so it may not be a satisfying answer but i i think it's uh it, it's it's something that needs to be recognized as well. And that is that uh, social media platforms and, and digital sources of data, first of all, they're wonderful. Uh, I've made most of my research career working with them because they provide a lot of advantages. Uh, one thing that I have become increasingly aware of and tried to become even more aware of in recent years though, is that um, data itself is not objective. The way that social media platforms have been designed represent cultural, um, internal, uh, economic values. So uh, I know the question was about, you know, researching a particular culture through the data that they produce on social media. I, I don't have a great answer to that. I think it's a wonderful question. I think just as important of a question though, is to ask how does the data, how does the way that it's structured, how does the platform itself convey cultural values and does that in any way uh, shape the conclusions that I am drawing through this? So for, on Twitter, for example, there are a limited number of ways to interact. Uh, with tweets, if Twitter were designed in Namibia rather than in Silicon Valley, would those sets um, of interaction ways and would the kinds of data that they produce be different? Um, and what kind of Silicon Valley values, like what value is it to the, uh, Twitter as a company to allow for liking a tweet and retweeting a tweet, but maybe not doing X or Y or Z with it? Uh, that, that's, that's a difficult question. Um, it takes some digging, uh, but it is something that I think is increasingly important and that I'm trying to do better about in my own research. And I'll just uh, jump in and say, I mean, one of the reasons that I wanted to offer this webinar is that I think that you know now when more people are doing research online, that if you're doing research that involves participants, whether it's qualitative, quantitative, mixed, if you're, engaging with participants in a field-based research where just the process of making the arrangements to travel to the place and find a place to stay and making relationships with a, you know, a hosting organization of some kind, you would be learning and listening along the way you know, to find out, well, you know, how are people talking with one another and what are the questions that they have, et cetera. Whereas if I'm going to just say, well, I'll, I'll, I think I'll, you know, interview uh, 20 people in Cape Town. Well, I'm not making those, I don't need to take those steps. So I didn't learn those kinds of things along the way. So, you know, I would encourage people to say, well, you still need to learn those things along the way somehow. And I, I you know, emphasize the point that uh, Tutelani made earlier about, you know, finding the partners who can help you, you know, understand, you know, what the, some of, you know, the cultural dynamics might be around uh, the, the, the topic that you are studying. So I think all of the things that we have discussed here um, apply perhaps even more so, you know, when you're thinking about uh, doing research online, you know, as our, as our mentioned, I mean, not, not everyone has access to the same technology. So, you know, choosing, you know, what you're going to do, you know, it's going to also tie into uh, access and digital literacy. Uh, so, you know, building on also what, what Spencer was saying, the, the platforms are not neutral. I think what we're kind of saying is like, nothing's neutral. So we need to be digging into, you know, the, um, you know, kind of underlying uh, premises in whatever we're doing. And I think we're probably towards the end of our time. I, I want to just uh, 
reiterate that we will share the, the various articles and resources that were mentioned uh, by panelists uh, in the follow-up uh, posts on methodspace.com. And we will uh, follow up with uh, questions that we didn't have time to get to. Uh, we'll try to, to find some responses for you there. So um, we hope that this will uh, encourage you to, to come and uh, visit us on Method Space uh, and follow us uh, on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, uh, to, to stay up to date. And uh, what else do we need to, to uh, close with? Sure, Chris. I'll jump in here. Um, so just uh, echo what Janet said, thank you very much uh, to everyone joining, uh, a big thank you to all the panellists for taking part. Uh, our next uh, webinar will be on survey research and is scheduled for June, and there'll be more details to follow soon, um, so please sign up to that um, newsletter that I mentioned earlier, you'll get all the latest information from there. And we're always looking for guest contributors, uh, so please do get in touch with us uh, via the Method Space website if you are interested in writing a post. And just one last thing to say, uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter for the latest research news uh, and research methods uh, from, from Sage. Um, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>